Good afternoon. This is Karen Sanchez. Thanks for joining us today for the Affordable Care Act reporting update for 2016. With, with the Affordable Care Act evolving as it is, um, you know, in, in the election that's come up, there's been a lot of question about whether or not Affordable Care Act will be here to stay or will it evolve and change into something different than we have today. Uh, for right now, we are taking the approach that nothing has changed in the law. We need to proceed with uh, doing the filings for 2016. Uh, if, if I was a betting person, I would I would think we're going to also have reporting for 2017. As uh, is, is you may recall, the the reporting is required uh, to satisfy to satisfy the employer mandate, um, and the employer mandate is the portion of the bill that helps subsidize the credits that are be, being given to some individuals who are applying through the exchanges, et cetera. Uh, those folks are already going through that open enrollment process right now and, and receiving. Uh, making their enrollment decisions based on credits they anticipate receiving. So in order to really keep the balance of the uh, budget, if that is a goal of the government, um, that likely we'll still be seeing this for 2017. But we'll keep you abreast of changes as they uh, continue to happen. But for today's presentation, we'll move forward as if uh, everything is going to continue on its way. Um, so a couple areas I wanted to talk about today was what, what we're seeing as sort of the completion of the 2015 filing that most of you have completed at this point, uh, but with the focus of the presentation being on some of the changes we have for 2016 as well as some of the things that might impact 2017 as some of you may be in the process of your open enrollment. Um, and then we've got some examples at the end, time permitting to go through. Uh, if we run out of time, we'll, um, you'll have those as a resource. Uh, for your viewing uh, at your convenience. So as 2015 wraps up, uh, that filing wraps up, uh, for those of us who did the filing process, we really just got those filed at the end of June um, and then have been helping clients coordinate with some of the correspondence from the IRS uh, that followed those filings. Uh, so the clients received some uh, IRS filing notices of a couple of different types. Uh, one would be that the report was accepted with errors and the primary error being some taxpayer identification number or TIN mismatches. Um, some had outright rejections in them in which they had 60 days to correct. Uh, some of the rejections we heard from clients about was their software printed it in portrait format and must be in landscape format. Um, you know, there might have been other situations where their software providers didn't have the right programming. Uh, we're still getting calls from folks that still have not been able to file for 15 and are asking for, you know, assistance and trying to get those through. So it's been a challenging year as software providers. We're trying to meet the IRS criteria, et cetera. Uh, clients are also receiving um, IRS employer shared responsibility payment notices, so we'll touch on, on that as well. Um, the first type of notice then is these error system messages. That's what the IRS is calling the um, reporting system, if you will, to submit the 1095 or 1094C and 1095C forms. Um, there's questions out there as to whether or not when you receive one of these error messages you're mandated or not to submit a response uh, with regard to that. When you look at that error message, you may identify that there is nothing that needs to be changed. Therefore, how do you respond or how do you clear that error? Uh, that's the interpretation that most folks are taking with respect to that. So if you did get some of these edit messages, you certainly want to take a look at them to determine the nature of them and determine whether or not it uh, requires any type of response. Uh, as I said before, most of those notices relate to these TIN errors and the IRS did put out a, um, a some, some rules that we'll go through uh, in August of this year to give some guidance as to what uh, they expect employers to do to identify these errors. Um, again, the TIN mismatches are the most common errors. What the IRS is trying to do is essentially match up each one of the Social Security numbers that you provided on the filing, including the dependents, and match that up to what they have in their database. And if differences came up even as simple as there's a period in a middle name or a, a full name out there and the names don't match exactly, um, they're including that there's a TIN mismatch error. However, they don't identify which person on the form uh, that error was rec was uh, relating to. So it's a bit of a, a searching game for employers to identify some of those items. In 2015, you may recall that the IRS provided this good faith compliance standard um, indicating they're not going to penalize employers if you can demonstrate you, you did your best and um, 
and uh, due to some other mitigating facts, you weren't able to, you know, perhaps receive all those taxpayer ID numbers or things like that. Um, that standard was actually just recently extended into 2016, just a week or so ago. Um, so the IRS is uh, acknowledging that this is a significant reporting burden, and they're indicating informally that their objective is to get um, com employers to comply and submit the information and that they're not trying to make this a revenue generating item. So yet to be determined, but that's sort of what the informal um, announcements have been recently. So the TIN solicitation process then um, came out in August providing uh, employers with some guidance as to what they should do in order to make sure that they are meeting some of these standards. Uh, it's really a three-step process. Uh, the employer is supposed to make an initial solicitation through the open enrollment process. You're asking employers for their, or employees rather, for their um, tax ID number, which is likely happening uh, consistently. Um, then you're supposed to make a second solicitation within a reasonable time thereafter if you don't receive that information or you identify that there's um, an error, such as with your 2015 filing. And then you're supposed to make a third request by the December 31st of the year following the initial solicitation. So if we're talking about the 2015 year, that would mean by December of 2017 you'd be making your third request for the 2015 information. The initial solicitation um, you know, was satisfied if an employer already had enrolled folks you know, prior to the enactment of these rules. Um, if an employer had not done so by the time these were enacted, they said to do so within a reasonable period of time. And if you had employees whose coverage was terminated before um, the certain date, you were deemed to have satisfied all these processes. So in other words, you don't have to go back in time to those folks who are no longer working with you to try to receive that information. Then your first annual solicitation is done by December 31st of the year after enrollment. So really by December 31st of 16, if we're talking again about the 15 year, uh, to again make another attempt uh, to receive that information. Uh, what many of our clients were doing is, is if they got edits or errors rather from the filing of the 2015 return, they were reaching out to those individuals indicating what uh, was, was demonstrated from the IRS and asking for them to get back to them by a certain date. Um, if any of the data that had been provided was inaccurate or needed updating. Um, so this is the IRS form that was, was provided to individuals. Um, and again, um, really December 31st is, is supposed to be the date that you should have reached out to any of those individuals that you had some errors on. Or if you didn't, employers aren't receiving their notice until, for example, December, then they give you 30 days or the end of January to comply um, with that requirement. Then, of course, your second initial solicitation, um, you know, would be the end of this year. Um, so the other types of notices that employers may have been receiving, um, not related to the filing, um, there's a notification process through the exchange where individuals can go to receive uh, coverage, uh, individual policies. Um, and the, this notification was intended to be a, giving the heads up to the employer that an employee has been found to be eligible for an advance payment of a premium credit or subsidy. Uh, the other type of notice that's actually that would be co coming from um, the government would be what they call the certification process, and this is how the IRS is going to communicate with employers about that shared responsibility penalty or the employer mandate penalties uh, that we've all been trying so hard to avoid uh, being subject to. The IRS has not yet set up this process to assess penalties for the 2015 year. Um, it's anticipated that employers will have the right to appeal assessments when they come through, um, and we're hopeful that we'll have guidance by the end of 2016, but uh, with the IRS, you never quite know when we might receive um, information on that. Uh, the notices from the exchange, then, that you may have received, um, the notices are fairly generic. It provides the employee's information name on there, and it indicates that he or she may have indicated one of the following criteria on their form, that they had no offer of health coverage by the employer, or an offer of the health coverage was made, but it didn't meet some of these affordability standards that we'll talk about, or the employee couldn't enroll in coverage because they were in a waiting period. You don't know which one of the things that employee indicated, but it just says one of those things occurred. So the notice also tells you that you um, can appeal the determination if you don't feel that the employee met one of these criteria. So we got a lot of questions about, well, should I appeal or not appeal? 
Um, and to clarify that notice is not a notice of penalty. It's, it's just to be a heads up to give you the opportunity to say, well, I did offer that employee coverage. You know, they provided inaccurate information and that you could hopefully uh, provide some updated information before, um, you know, so that the, that the IRS would be able to update their records accordingly. Um, but a lot of times the notices are inaccurate. They've not verified any information that the employee reported. Um, and they make no attempt to confirm any elements of that um, throughout that period. Um, if they're just even in a waiting period, um, which is obviously completely acceptable, they're still going to potentially be eligible for that credit and, um, and, and not cause the employer any penalty situations. The fact that an employee rece receives a subsidy doesn't mean that they're actually entitled to it. When they file their tax return, they may have to pay back some of those amounts. Um, and failing to appeal this notice doesn't impact the employer's liability um, for, for a, one of the mandate taxes and doesn't limit your ability to protest an assessment later. So there's really no tax reason that you have to appeal um, this determination, um, but there might be other employment-related issues that um, you might want to talk to legal counsel about with regard to those um, as well. So we'll move on now to the 2016 reporting changes. Um, not a lot, but you know, with, with everything that we've learned a little bit through the process and IRS provided some guidance uh, along the way. Uh, one thing I wanted to do before we, we jumped right into that is for those of you who haven't been living and breathing um, Affordable Care Act rules throughout the year, I wanted to just take a moment to kind of go through some of the definitions that we learned last year um, as the be applicable as we talk about some of the changes. So, one of the objectives in doing all this filing is to demonstrate that you satisfied the employer mandate coverage and you're not subject to any penalties. And there's really three different categories or criteria you needed to satisfy in order to uh, not be subject to penalties. The first is you had to offer affordable coverage. And that affordability standard is using your lowest cost self-only health plan. And that cost of that plan should not be more than an indexed amount, which is 9.66% of your full-time employee's household income for 2016. And if your premium structure that you provided employees meets this criteria, your plans deemed to be affordable for the year. Uh, the IRS provided a number of safe harbors when you're determining, using, or determining your affordability um, that, that can be used. So those that are specific to the employee would be there's a W-2 method where you take the 9.66% of their W-2 wages. Another is the rate of pay where you use 9.66% of their monthly wages. Um, or you can apply one standard across all the employees, uh, which is the federal poverty line standard, which says it's 9.66% of the federal poverty level, um, which is about $94 a month for, tw for 2016. So we can use any of these methods to make sure that the coverage we're providing is affordable. Uh, other items that need to be satisfied are your plan needs to provide minimum essential coverage uh, to your employees. Usually this um, has been built into your plan and you're, when you were working with your broker or consultant. Essentially you can't you know, exclude all hospital coverage or other major forms of coverage um, and still meet the criteria. And then the final criteria would be that it has to provide minimum value. Um, in other words, it can't be so stripped down that it provides, you know, 20% of what your actual medical costs are. And so there's some actuarial formulas that go into that to make sure that it provides minimum value. There's calculators out there, and typically, again, those plans are designed, most plans we've seen have been designed to ensure that those criteria are met. So what do we have with respect to 2016 reporting changes? Um, some of the extended, extended deadlines have been eliminated for the IRS filing. I mentioned before, we just got everything filed by June 30th last year. Um, that date will be moved up to its normal um, deadline for the coming year. Um, we received some guidance for things like opt-out payments, flex credits, things that affect those affordability rules that we just talked about that we'll go through. Most of our transition rules have been eliminated. Um, and with respect to the good faith reporting penalties that I talked about earlier, originally those were going to be eliminated, but just uh, about a week and a half ago, the IRS decided to reinstate them, which is great um, that they are recognizing folks are still working through the process to make sure that this uh, reporting is handled smoothly. Uh, the employer mandate for coverage uh, for 2016, you know, you must have covered 95% of your employees instead of the 70%. 
um, and there's a penalty of the 2160 for all full-time employees um, if you didn't cover if you didn't meet that 95% threshold. We had a couple of coding changes for the 1095C that we'll go through, and then as I said before, we've got some examples of how those coding scenarios might look, um, time permitting. So the deadlines for the 2016 filing, the employee reporting uh, was originally due January 31st, 2017, although uh, about a week and a half ago, the IRS came issued IRS Notice 2016-70, which extended the deadline to March 2nd, 2017, with respect to providing the employee copy uh, out to the uh, participants or to the employees. Um, the employer filing is still, you know, to be submitted by its normal date. Um, and if you're filing electronically, you have until March 31st uh, to submit everything to the IRS. Uh, just a reminder that if you are filing more than 250 forms, similar to your W-2 and 1099 requirements, you must be filing the forms electronically. I think most people file electronically. I was, um, you know, when you look at the forms, there's so many codes on there that I worry about the IRS hand typing some of those things in, um, you know, when not filing electronically. So I think that's the desired method to, to expedite things. Okay, so the first uh, one of the items, and this is really some, these are going to be a couple items that won't necessarily probably affect 2016, but for those of you who are in the process of open enrollment for 2017, um, may want to take these into account. Um, different items that it could affect the affordability rules that we talked about. So I said, you have to have your lowest cost only coverage that's not more than 9.66% of income. So a couple items that could affect that not just being the premium they offer to the coverage uh, would be the items that we're going to go through next. So one of them was the opt-out payments. Um, the IRS issued notice 2015-87 uh, that provided guidance and some transition period on, on these areas. So an opt-out payment is one in which you um, say to your employees, if you don't want to take our coverage, uh, that's fine. And by the way, I'll give you, you know, $100 a month for not taking our coverage. It's taxable to you. We'll add it to your paycheck, but you're going to receive, you know, $100 a month or whatever number was selected. So questions came up about, well, how does that affect, if at all, the affordability rules that we just talked about? Um, so the IRS came out with guidance that says, well, it depends, um, and, and they define two different types of opt-out payments, conditional and unconditional. So the unconditional says it doesn't matter, whatever, if you elect out of our health insurance plan, we're going to give you $100, it doesn't matter. In this type of an arrangement, um, that contribution will affect the affordability rules. So in this example, um, if the employee's cost of coverage to enroll in the plan was $50, and now you're giving them $100 because they did not take coverage, the IRS would say that the uh, affordability level is actually $150 that it costs the employee because now they have $100 in their pocket and they would have spent another $50, so there's $150 is actually the number you would use for affordability on the um, standards. Uh, the conditional opt-out payment relates to um, if the employer provides a meaningful requirement related to the provision of health care um, to the employee, such as requiring that employee to provide that they have coverage under their spouse's plan, something of that nature. So they have to, in order to receive that opt-out payment, they have to sign something saying, well, I'm going to be on my spouse's plan. In this case, you would not have to add that $100 a month, in my example, to the um, affordability calculation when you're making that determination. So for the effective date of the opt-out rules then were that for it's going to be for plan years beginning on or after January 1st, 2017. So for those of you who are in the open enrollment process, wanted to bring it to your attention to if maybe you didn't uh, require uh, individuals to sign something um, about that opt-out, perhaps that could be implemented so that you wouldn't have to make these adjustments to your affordability rules. It could make the difference between, you know, maybe if you were in my example, you only charged employees $50. You wouldn't have to do certain reporting on the form that we'll talk about later, but with the addition of this other $100 in there, now you're going to have to do some expanded reporting on there. Um, so 
that that's applicable for most employers. However, if you just added the opt-out payments after these rules came out, then you would be subject to including those in your reporting for 2016. Um, also, if you um, have union employees operating under collective bargaining agreement, you have some additional uh, period of time uh, you know, after that uh, collective bargaining agreement expires before you would actually have to do this. Um, another area is flex credits that, um, and how those might impact affordability. So flex credit under a cafeteria plan would be a situation where an employer says you have $200 a month to spend on your health care benefits. You choose how you want to allocate it. Do you want to pay for some health insurance premiums? you want to use it for daycare? you want to use it for FSA benefits, et cetera? And the employee would make their election as to how they want to allocate sort of their budgeted amount of money. So the question comes up, well, it's employer money that's being provided. Does this then, is this considered to be part of the affordability calculation and the IRS said that if you meet these three criteria then you can use that flex credit to reduce the calculation of the employee's required contribution that's used for the affordability rules. Um, so the flex credit may be only used to reduce the employee's required contribution towards employer-sponsored health care coverage. You can't receive cash for it. Um, it must be used exclusively for medical care. So in my example, if you were allowing it to be used for dependent care, the IRS would not allow this to be considered part of um, a reduction in the employee's required contribution, and you could have premiums that are set out there you know, that might not meet the affordability rules when not factoring in you know, this flex credit. This has the same effective date as the opt-out, meaning it's for plans that are beginning on or after January 1st of 2017. Um, the third category that could affect that affordability number is health reimbursement arrangements. These are uh, plans in which the employer provides dollars towards the provision of uh, medical care. Usually, you see it most often where as employers increase the deductibility limit um, on the um, health insurance plans because of all the rising costs, you know, they used to have a $500 deductible, now they have a $1,500 deductible, and they'll say, well, I'm going to pay the first $500 of your coverage, um, and then after that, you're going to pay some, and then after that, your coverage kicks in. So the question is, well, what about these types of employer payments? Are these considered factored into the affordability rules or not? Um, and the IRS said that um, they will reduce the employee's required contribution for affordability if uh, the HRA can only be used to pay for premiums or other cost-sharing, non-covered benefits under the plan, and has to be integrated, um, you know, with with the plan. And there's a whole set of rules about what integration means, essentially. Uh, but essentially, as long as you're using the HRA to work, in sort of that example I just provided, that they will be used to uh, reduce the employee's required contribution. They must be provided that information in advance when they made their decision um, in order to enroll in the plan. Yeah, okay, so that's covered. Um, with everything the IRS does, there must be a reporting penalty associated with it. So the 2016 instructions indicate that if you fail to file that 1095C form, um, it's $260 per violation. And so what that violation means is it's $260 when you fail to provide it to the employee, and it's another $260 to when you fail to provide it to the IRS. So you're at $520 per person uh, for not doing the filing. But, you know, it's capped out at $3 million, so, um, you know, no, no worries there that we can cap the penalty. You know, and again, the IRS indicated informally that it's not their goal to be assessing these types of penalties, but it is an option there, um, you know, so for sort of for uh, those that are just going to have an intentional disregard of those requirements. Okay, so moving on, um, I did want to just, this is not, is not a change for 2016, but I did just want to put a reminder out there that everything that we talk about with respect to these filing of these forms that we're coming up with um, defines the employer. And take a step back before you jump into filing them to make sure that you've identified who the employer is. The definition of employer, similar to, to other IRS rules, includes anybody who's a part of a control group or affiliated service group. So it's important to review any of the ownership um, relationships that you may have or our governmental entities. Um, you know, use a good faith interpretation of those rules because there really isn't a lot of guidance provided for um, for governmental entities as to what those relate to because most of the rules out there relate to an ownership structure which 
obviously isn't relevant within that arena. So we spent a lot of time last year working with clients on determining you know, who's related to who and what is actually the employer. Because you can have a situation where you don't meet the filing requirement individually, but when you aggregate together different companies, that filing requirement is made based on the aggregate of all the related entities. However, when you actually go to file, you file separately for each entity, and I like to think about it as however the W-2s got filed, you should file these forms to match up the W-2s to the 1095-Cs, so you're filing through that same entity. You will be cross-referencing um, uh, employer names and IDs across the forms, but um, just wanted to, to put that reminder out there as well. So this is what the 2016 uh, Form 1094-C is, and as a reminder, this is the transmittal form. Um, that uh, you most of you submitted last year. It's, it's virtually unchanged. I circled a couple of the boxes at the bottom um, that we'll talk about in terms of um, possible changes for 2016. Most of these uh, you know, clients didn't have a lot of questions on other than line 22. Um, so we'll talk about the boxes in line 22 in a moment um, and what they mean and when you can utilize those amounts. Uh, this is uh, the second page of the 1094C. Uh, all they, they really clarified was a description at the top of that column B uh, for the coming year. Uh, so on line 22, they designated box B as reserved because that was really for uh, transition items. Box C now is really going to just uh, relate to fiscal year plans. Um, and then again, that language change was just made at the top of that column on the second page. So line 22, again, is where we spent time uh, last year on the 1094C, figuring out what information needs to be included. Um, and, and these aren't all optional boxes to use, but they give you the benefit of some simplified reporting. Um, so I always prefer to take the easiest way out and provide the least information possible. So we want to see if we can meet some of these criteria and, and simplify the process. So the first one, box A, um, is qualifying offer. So in order to meet this criteria, the employer provided a minimum value coverage plan with an employee cost less than that federal poverty line number that we talked about earlier. So it's $94.75 per month in 2016. And you provided that to all eligible employees for all month of the year. Um, and you must have also offered coverage to spouse independent children. So if you meet those criteria, to me this is one of the, the first decision points, is if you meet this criteria, then the benefit is that when you get onto the participant form, um, and if you recall, you, you have to put different coding in by month of what you offered, and in certain circumstances you have to put the cost of coverage by month by person. Well, if you meet this federal poverty line standard, you don't have to provide the cost of coverage, which can be a nice uh, feature. Uh, for individuals that might have had changes in premiums during the year or, well, it's just less information you have to report and, and figure out throughout the year. Um, so we always look to see if, if clients would qualify for this first before we dig into some of the other issues. Um, box C on that uh, line 22 was the transition relief box. Essentially, this is the same uh, question that we had last year, but this is only going to be applicable to fiscal year plans uh, for 2016. Uh, so if you think about the transition rules applied to months of the plan year that fell within 2015. So if you have a plan year that started within 2015, you may still be able to uh, realize some of those transition benefit rules uh, by checking this box if you meet some of the criteria here, uh, as long as you didn't you know, change things in your workforce and, and things of that nature. So fiscal year plans, this may still be a nice feature and you can utilize the code for the months of your plan year that uh, started in 2015 that fall within calendar year 2016. Uh, the last box then is box D, um, the 98% offer. To qualify for this, the employer has to have offered minimum value coverage to at least 98% of its full-time employees and offers minimum essential coverage to the employee's dependents. Um, the benefit of this is that you don't have to provide um, some extra counts on that page two of the 1094C. You don't have to provide the full number of full-time employees by month on the form. Everybody still always has to provide the total number of employees by month, but it's one less you know, set of numbers that you have to pull out for each 12 months of the year. So as long as when you, you offered your coverage, you hit 98% of your full-time employees, 
you know, most of our clients, I think, were, were qualifying for this and able to just include a little bit less details on that form. So the form 1095C, this is the one the employees receive, again, is, is really unchanged itself from the prior year. Um, we include the employee information, the employer information. Uh, we'll spend some time on part two going through the codes again, um, as that was sort of the challenging part of the filing last year. You feel really good when you get through part one and you can put all the employee information in and then, and then everybody sort of stops <laughs> trying to come up with the codes. Um, and then part three, the covered individuals uh, for the self-insured plans to report the employee and dependent information um, and who had coverage under the plan um, by month for the plan year. Um, so some of the chain, minor changes that you may not even notice if you weren't comparing one form to the other, they provided some clarifying instructions uh, on line 15 uh, to assist in what information was looked for there. Uh, the plan start month box that's sort of in the middle of that form uh, was optional for 15. They made it optional again for 16, but it's expected to be mandatory for 2017. So you don't need to report anything in there again for 2016, um, but, you, but you can certainly start to fill that in. Uh, they added language for part three uh, where you're reporting all the covered individuals under the plan to clarify that not only do you have to put spouse independent, but the employee themselves must be reported again in section three of the form. Um, it's not enough that they're at the top, they have to be listed specifically again at the bottom to indicate that they were covered. Um, of course, the affordability percentages adjusted each year, so those are just historically where we've ended up at um, to date with those percentages. We had a couple of codes eliminated, um, so now we're, we're kind of going through that, that middle section of 1095C talking about some of the codes um, that we entered on there. So codes 1I and 2I were eliminated. But they no longer applied because they're related to transition issues. Uh, we do have a couple of new codes available to use on line 14. Uh, code 1J can be used if um, the employer is providing minimum essential coverage that provides minimum value offered to the employee. And the minimum essential coverage was conditionally offered to the employee's spouse. And minimum essential coverage was not offered to the employee's dependents. Um, so this is similar to code 1D on the, the prior list of codes, but it focuses on that there's this conditional offer um, made, which is generally meaning that the employer spouse didn't have coverage somewhere else. Um, this is going to be, if you use this code, this could potentially lead to uh, being assessed a penalty because you're not meeting all of those different criteria that we needed um, to meet because you weren't offering the employee's dependence coverage under the plan. Um, a, a similar code 1K was added, so it's basically the same as 1J, except this one indicates you did offer the uh, plan to the employee's dependents. So this is more similar to code 1E um, on, on the prior filing. I should mention I, I kind of designed this webinar to be sort of that level 200 class over the level 100 class that we did before in an effort to not um, completely regurgitate kind of everything that we went through last year. If, if anybody wants a copy of the sort of the 100 level of the ACA presentation we did last year that has some more details on some of these codes. I'd be glad to, to send that off as well. Um, so if either one of these new codes is used, the employer has to fill out line 15, which again is the line that indicates the cost of coverage for the employees. Um, IRS provided a little bit of uh, clarifications on some of the codes for us as well this year. Last year we were trying to identify you know, some of those uh, terminated employees and COBRA and how we handle some of those different things. Um, so one of the codes they, they clarified was with respect to code 1G. Um, on this one the instructions clarify that 1G has to apply for the entire year or not at all. Um, and, and that's essentially what the code says on the form. I think there was just some questions that a code 1G essentially should always be in the box that says all 12 months and not in um, e any individual months because it always has to apply for all 12 months of the year or not at all. Um, so moving on to, to kind of the COBRA issue, um, uh, the instructions clarify that code 2C should not be entered on line 16 for any month in which the employee was um, enrolled in coverage that was not meeting minimum central coverage. That was just a clarification for 2C. And then finally, they indicated that code 2C should generally not be used for COBRA. 
Um, so what they're saying is that 2C is a reminder is that says the employees enrolled in coverage. So the instructions for 2015 said use 2C above any other code. So if they're enrolled in coverage, most of us use 2C to indicate they're enrolled in coverage because it applied. So now the IRS has said, well, if they're on COBRA, don't use 2C for that line, rather use code 2A, which says that the employee was not employed on any day of the month, or if the employee was a part-time employee, use code um, 2B, because you could have an employee who uh, was in an eligible position, meaning they worked you know, 30 hours or more, for example, to receive health care coverage, and then they dropped into a position where they only worked 15 hours a month and were no longer eligible for coverage, so they stayed on your plan, but they're paying at the COBRA rates now because they were no longer considered to be um, you know, an eligible employee. So in that case, you might use a 2B for that employee rather than um, the 2A or the 2C. Uh, the other thing, uh, the affordability safe harbor codes, um, the instructions clarify that for this, these affordability codes, and we kind of talked about these earlier, these were the, when you take the 9.66% of, of some number, that that meets the affordability rules, um, and one is that it, it's 9.66 of W-2 wages, rate of pay, or federal poverty line, um, that these should not be entered on line 16 for any month when the, the employer didn't offer minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of its employees. So you, know, you can't use the safe harbor rules unless you first, as an employer, have provided minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of its full-time employees. So if you only did to you know, a percentage less than that, then you can't use some of these affordability safe harbors um, going forward. Uh, for those of you who have uh, union employees, um, we were kind of glad to see last in 2015 that there was some multi-employer interim transition relief rules that allowed for some simplified reporting for those union members. Essentially, we were able to designate that they were um, a union member and we didn't have to know if they took coverage, we didn't have to know if they uh, include different rates or things like that. And so that transition relief uh, continues to apply for 2016. I think the IRS hasn't quite figured out how to uh, report on them differently at this point in time. Um, so the COBRA and um, post-employment coverage, um, we talked about this a little bit, that we have clarifying language now on how to report offer a COBRA and other post-employment coverage. They've got instructions, examples and instructions to the 1095C that goes through a number of scenarios that we just talked about, um, about not offering them coverage. Um, or not or using code 1H on line 14 if the employee was not employed for the month, 1H being that the employee was not offered coverage for those months. Um, and so if you are offering coverage to an employee who remains employed, in other words, they went to a part-time position, for example, those you would continue to list as an offer of coverage. So in other words, the IRS doesn't want to see that there's an offer of coverage to somebody who was not working for the company. And so the, the consistency of those codes um, is, is kind of what they're looking for here. So this is the summary of the codes that we are um, you know, dealing with for, for 2016 that we touched on. 1A is the nice, the nice code to be able to use when you are only charging your employees the 94.75 per month or less um, and meeting those other criteria and you can uh, file under the, um, the simplified method and not have to report the uh, premium amount on line 15. Uh, 1B through 1D is that you offered it to the employee and or a combination of dependents and spouses. 1E is probably what most of you would use if you don't qualify for 1A, that you offer minimum value to the employee and at least minimum essential coverage to your spouses and dependents. That's probably your, your most common one to be used. Um, and then you have a couple of other um, ones that might be used occasionally with the 1F through or 1F and 1G. 1H is when you don't offer any coverage, so you, you might use this in a situation where you have a new hire, somebody's in a waiting period, or they're part-time um, for part of the year, uh, or a terminated employee, but you're not offering them coverages in, in months when they're not working for you. And then the new codes 1J and 1K, uh, when there's some conditional offers to the spouse um, and then the codes would vary depending on how you treated your dependents.
So that was line 14, and then line 15 on the form then is if you were required based on your entry in line 14, if you were required to report your premiums, you listed those in line 15. And then as a reminder, line 16 was intended to be what, uh, did the employee take coverage or is there a safe harbor code to say you're not subject to the employer mandate? Um, so 2A says the employee was not employed any day in the month. 2B says they were part-time or in a termination month, but not you know cover that entire month. 2C would be your probably most common one if they are actually enrolled in coverage for at least one day of the month. Uh, 2D is that the employee was in a non-assessment period or a waiting period. So if you've got a 30-day wait uh, when somebody was hired, you know, you'd, you'd report the 2D for that month of time. Um, you'd put 2A for the months prior to when they started, and then you'd shift them over to the 2D while they're in the waiting period. And then if they enroll in coverage, then they'd be a 2C. A uh, 2E is, is for those union plans and multi-employer plan interim relief. If you've got union employees, I think most of our clients took advantage of using this code, um, again, to avoid determining if they enrolled or didn't enroll and things like that. And then the remaining three codes are in situations where none of these apply, um, and essentially your employee probably waived coverage um, and to satisfy that you uh, met the affordability standard, how did you meet that? Did you use the W-2 safe harbor method? Um, did you use the federal poverty line method? Or did you use the rate of pay um, safe harbor method? Um, we had another question come in as well um, with respect to those employers that provide union coverage and there's multiple unions. Um, and will you have to get all that information together for the unions? Um, so that question is, again, going to be optional uh, for 16. But for 17, um, again, I think that's one of the things that they have to iron out. Uh, there are clarity in the instructions that if you have multiple uh, reporting periods, uh, which one you use. I'm, uh, I'm thinking it's the earliest one that um, starts within the plan year. But I'd have to confirm that in the instructions. Um, if you can't locate that in the instructions that, that has been added this year, uh, send me an email and I can, I can pull that out and send that to you um, offline here as well. So we've got a few more minutes, so we'll, we'll work on going through some of these um, coding examples. I'm sort of a visual learner, so when we uh, started learning this last year, I had to put it in a grid to sort of frame uh, how to start using all these codes in different scenarios. So. Um, most companies are going to have a scenario where you have a new employer, a new hire, um, and the employee may take coverage. So in this example, the employee was hired May 2nd of 2016. The employer plan provides for entry on the first payroll period of, following, of the month following the date of hire, um, and the employee opted to take coverage. The employer does provide minimum value coverage for um, employee spouses and dependents. The employer charges $100 uh, per month for the self-only coverage. So this employee didn't start until May. So for months, um, you know, so it, up through June 1st, the employee was not offered coverage because they offered coverage um, the first of the month following the date of hire. So in months prior to that, you see 1H, the employee was not offered coverage in any months, obviously, when they weren't working for the company. And in addition, they um, weren't offered coverage until June 1st. So we use 1H January through May. And then 1E is the code that we use that said the employer offered coverage to the uh, employee, spouse, and or dependents. So we see 1E for the rest of the year. On line 15, you'll see that in when code 1H is used, there's no requirement to complete line 15. Uh, so when it shifts to a 1E, we report uh, the premium that would be charged for the self-only coverage of the $100 for those months for the balance of the year. And then line 16 is where we reported that there was uh, what, what uh, coverage was taken by the employee. So in months January through April, the employee was not employed, so we used 2A that they were not employed any day of the month. In May, we switched to a code 2D. Uh, because that employee was in a waiting period after their hire for the month of May. And then in June 1st, uh, the employee took coverage, so we shift to code 2C uh, for the balance of the year. Um, and this is really just kind of a, a summary of, of, um, of some of the items that we talked about. Uh, one, one item to note, if the employee's 
coverage uh, for self coverage was less than I, in my example, I used $100. If it had been, you know, 94.75 or less, then I could have used 1A on that first line, and then I wouldn't have needed to complete uh, line 15 in this example. And I think we covered most of that language. Um, so, what if you have a new hire that opts out of coverage? So, if we use the same fact pattern as we had before, uh, with same hire date, etc., you'll see line 14 uh, looks just the same. Here's where we would have the uh, example we talked about earlier where the employer provides a cash opt-out payment of $50 and and this would really assume what it would look like when those opt-out rules become effective now January 1st 2017 that we talked about earlier in this case once those rules become effective and still instead of using the $100 uh, per month I would be shifting to $150 per month being reported um, and this case also on line 16, you'll see January through June, uh, I'm sorry, January through May looks identical, uh, but then in June, we were going to end up using the code 2F instead of 2C because this individual opted out um, with respect to determining those affordability rules. Uh, so what happens when an employee terminates from the company? Um, again, if I use the same fact pattern as we started with before, Actually, I should have changed this to a termination date of November 15th of 2016. I apologize. Um, the employer extends. So my codes on line 14 are um, the same up until my termination date in November, at which time in November then I changed to a code 1H because I did not offer coverage then you know, upon their termination. Um, and same thing within December. Um, line 15 then we'd complete the same uh, premium cost for the months in which coverage was offered. And then line 16, uh, we would have the same as in our prior example, except that for the month of December then, we would shift to a 2A when the employees uh, no longer considered covered under the, uh, the terms of the plan. So that's just some uh, explanation of what we just talked about. Um, you could also have situations where there's a change in status of the employee. So again, if I use my same fact pattern, um, but in this case, the employee um, goes to a part-time status no longer eligible for the plan October 1st of 2016, and they don't take COBRA. So in this case, the employee, again, my coding on line 14, I, we didn't offer coverage through May, so it's a 1H. They go to a 1E during times when they were employed and we offered coverage. Then, at the time when they um, are no longer in an eligible status, we'd go to a 1H because they're not offering coverage to the employee any longer. Line 15, we report the coverage in months when they um, were offered coverage. And then line 16 uh, would be the same until we get to uh, October, at which time we would need to um, switch to a 2B because they were a part-time employee. Um, during those months. We can't say 2C because they didn't take coverage, well, and the new guidance tells us not to, um, and 2A wouldn't be applicable because they were, in fact, still employed for those months. Um, here's an example of those of you who have uh, multi-employer plans that you sponsor. Um, again, in that same fact pattern, every month of the year, we would use that uh, 1H because you, you're, that's how we're instructed to use 1H when, line, when code 2E is used. Um, in this case, you know, line 16 was completed that they didn't work for the company January through April, so we still put a 2A. Um, they were in a waiting period, and then we just moved to the 2E uh, for the balance of the year. So I think we might have had a couple questions come in here. Let's see how I an do answering these on the, on the fly. So one of the questions is multi-employer interim relief. Um, do you use a 2E? on line 16 instead of 2D during the assessment period. I think we just covered um, that. We, we still use the 2D during that period of time. Um, I've seen, I don't know that the IRS is going to care one way or another because either way they're not eligible for that period of time. That's typically how we have been uh, presenting it absent any other guidance in the interim. Um, the next question is if we offer coverage that takes effect the first day of employment, and the employee enrolls in coverage, would it enter 1E and 2C again if the employee started mid-month? So the rules for um, 
let's see if employee type. Uh, so if you get hired the first day of employment, let's go back to our uh, new employee hire. Um, so the, the employee. So you would use 1E immediately for the month of hire because they were offered coverage in that month. Um, the, the rules for 2C say, well, the rules for the line 14 has to be in effect for the entire month. Um, so you would probably need to put that the employee is in a waiting period uh, for the line 14 and then for line 16, you could still use the 2C because they only have to have been employed um, one day in order to have the coverage reported under under 2C. And the last question that we have is how do you report for termination when coverage ends on the last day of employment? For example, the term date and the coverage date end on November 15th. So if we go back to our employee terminating. Um, so again, line 16 is going to be if they were covered under your plan even for one day of the month, you would need to put 2C because they were still covered for the month. Um, and then on line 14, you would indicate, I guess if they were offered coverage part of the month, then you would continue to put the 1E uh, for that portion of the month. And we had one more question. I lied about one more question. Um, for COBRA, what, what amount do you use for line 15? So actually under the new rules for COBRA, you wouldn't end up um, actually reporting anything for COBRA because in the months when you go switch over to having COBRA, you're going to use the code 1H on line 14. And when you use a code 1H, the instructions indicate you don't complete line 15. Um, so actually when you have a COBRA situation, you really should not be completing uh, line 15 as well. So thanks everybody for, for attending today and we will see what, what future changes we have to all the rules we just talked about today. All right, thanks everyone.